Excellent. Um, so can everyone hear me at the back? Yeah, all good. Is the microphone on? Yeah, hello, people from the future. Good. Um, so thanks to the organizers for setting this up, and thanks to all of you for powering through this very long and intense conference. Um, we're going to have 20 more minutes of a bit of math, and then we'll go get coffee, which is always good. Um, quick note, um, if you've read my abstract, there's a, whole, there's a few things that I said in my abstract that I'll be talking about and they won't be talking about because um, I decided to change a few of my slides in the last few days based on what other people were thinking and talking about. And I'm hoping that the changes will be for the best, but I guess we will never know. Um, good. So um, very quick acknowledgments to the people that actually did most of the work and most of the thinking. Um, Fernando is in there. If you want to ask him any of the tricky questions, ask me the easy ones. Um, good. So let's um, dive right in. And I want to be talking about theories and axioms and sort of how we axiomatize and then operationalize a bunch of theories. Um, in particular, I'm going to be sort of comparing standard Shannon information theory and you know, integrated information theory. And in Shannon information theory, we have a bunch of axioms, the shannon kinchin axioms, such as any measure of information that should be continuous, it should be maximal for a uniform distribution, blah, blah. You put all of these things in, and you end up with the equation for entropy, p log p, that we know and love. Um, and that's unique. And that's it. If you, given those axioms, this is the only measure that satisfies it. If you knock out one or part of the axioms, then we get a generalized family of entropies that people have been playing around for a while. In IIT, we have this other bunch of axioms, which are not about information per se, but about phenomenology. And if you crunch all of these together, you get some form of a measure of phi um, and many other things along the way. But that is sort of the picture of IIT, that it starts from a bunch of axioms, goes through some mathematical postulates, ends up with a bunch of mathematical operationalization of this. Um, so the axiomatic basis of IIT is in itself up to debate. Uh, and examining the axioms is philosopher's work. Uh, there's this paper by Tim Bain uh, in Neuroscience of Consciousness uh, some time ago that is, you know, has something to say. There's also quite a few things to say about this paper in itself. But anyway, what I'm going to do for the purpose of this talk is I'm going to assume the axioms are valid. I'm going to assume they're fine, philosophically, or that they describe what we want to describe by phenomenology. Um, and I'm going to ask, do they provide a valid mathematical basis for IIT? In particular, I'm going to be talking about the axiom of integration of this notion that you have some process, neural or physical or otherwise, and that you can cut it in half. And then cutting it in half tells you to what extent these two things are integrated. And we can quantify this in some way or another. Okay. So what's going to be my, my take home message out of this? Um, I'm going to come up with a few conclusions, hopefully. Um, one is that I'm going to try and con sort of convince you that there's no such thing as a single universal measure of integrated information. Um, another thing that we managed to do is that we can mathematically decompose uh, integrated information into these joint parts. So we have this big construct that is phi, or this integrated information, and we try to break it down into more like elemental, elementary pieces that we can then reason about and manipulate. And you know, this is the bit that I added, is that these information atoms that come out of the structure of integrated information, then may have something to say um, about causal emergence. Uh, and at this point, I'd really like to make a mention here, which is that more recent developments in, in IIT, especially within IIT3, are basically also shifting away from the focus on you know, this one big phi measure onto focusing on small phi measures and the structure of conceptual spaces and blah, blah. And I think that is quite aligned with this notion of, well, yeah, there's, there's many different types of integrations, and we need to look at the types instead of trying to clump it all together into one number. So I very much I don't want to misrepresent my fellow integrated information theorists. Like, I think we're very much aligned, or to some extent aligned in this, in this point. Um, good. So I'm going to divide this talk in three parts, roughly. First, I'm going to be talking about measuring integration and phi measures and all of this in typically in the context of IIT2. Then in part two, I'm going to be talking about this integrated information decomposition of phi ID 
in which we get these five meshes and we try and split them up and open them up and look inside and see what mathematical structures we find. And in part three, it's going to be a bit more speculative about what these things have to say about the nature of causal emergence and how we would go about defining it or finding it. Um, I'm, I'm quite confident that the math for parts one and two is quite correct. Part three is speculation and I'm happy to debate about the implication, philosophical implications for some of it. But I want to like put a small disclaimer on, pretty sure the math is right. Let's discuss the philosophy open, you know, with an open mind. Good. Um, let's talk about measuring integration. And to do that, I think it's useful to go back to the origins of where the, these um, ideas of integrated information come from historically, uh, so we can understand the evolution. Uh, and as a short history of IoT, well, IoT, I, you know, it typically started way back when in sort of 1990 something, um, with the basic idea, the basic intuition, that consciousness results from two opposing forces. You have one side, you have this differentiation uh, that brain regions can act independently of each other. But then also the brain is integrated in the sense that it can also integrate into a high level cognition. Uh, these intuitions were laid out by Tononi, Sports, and Edelman in the 90s. And I think these are beautiful and like really, really powerful set of intuitions. And that's why we're here still like 20 years later discussing them. What's the deal with this? The, the deal with this is that they, you know, you start with by presupposing these two extremes, right? We want something that is neither too differentiated nor integrated, right? And typically, so in, also they were coming from this sort of complexity science type background and the, there's this classical example of a cup of coffee. We have a cup of coffee that's very ordered and then you drop some milk and then the milk does funny patterns and convoluted clouds and then it ends up becoming a mess of basically indistinguishable milk and coffee. Um, so see if we were to plot this imaginary axis of regularity of the system in one in the x-axis and um, phi on the, on the other axis, then we want something that is zero on one side and then zero on the other side, meaning not totally integrated, not totally differentiated, but it can be whatever in between. Meaning that we're trying to fit a function based only on boundary conditions, which is incomplete. Um, and not only that, but I think a more fundamental issue with this is that this assumes that there's a single order parameter, right? So again, going to back to this like cartoon from 1998, um, the way this narrative typically goes is that you have one sort of parameter you can vary in your model. Typically, this mixed in with some like statistical physics-y type thing where you have a phase transition or something, and then things are funky in the middle and then boring at either side. But actually, that's not how, typ how reasonable brain models look. They're usually something like this. So this is a model by Peter Robinson's lab in, in Sydney, where instead of having one, you know, a 1D uh, control parameter, we have a more than one parameter. And now the critical point becomes a critical manifold, um, where basically everything on one side is order and everything on the other side is disorder, roughly. And then the different stages is a model of sleep with slow wave sleep, eye open, eyes closed, blah, blah. And all of them are roughly you know, similar distance to this boundary. And again, we can compare these different states in many ways, but comparing it in terms of which one is closest to that integration differentiation boundary sort of just misses the point, um, roughly. Um, more um, recent versions of IT instead focus on deviations from uh, independence or reducibility. Uh, this is beautiful PNAS paper by Masafumi Oizumi and colleagues in 2016 that says, well, I have a very connected model, and then I cut it, calculate some form of KL divergence, and that tells me how integrated they are, which is a great mathematization of this. But still, there are many ways in which a system can deviate from independence. In particular, we had this um, paper a couple of years ago, where, no, actually, last year, uh, where we argue some of this. And some of the results as well, what we did, we get a whole bunch of measures of five type measures that have been proposed. And all of these measures are measures that are consistent with this broad intuition of capturing a balance of integration and differentiation. Um, we run them on the same little toy system. In this case, just two coupled units with some correlated noise. And we see that they're all over the place. So they don't agree on, you know, it's not that they have slight numerical differences, they just are all over the place. So 
these things are capturing genuinely different aspects of how the system is integrated. They're not approximations to the same thing. They're different stuff. Um, we can do the same thing if we put now coupling on the y-axis and correlation on the x-axis. Again, messages all over the place. So conceptually similar measures behave very differently. Which, you know, the conclusion I draw from this is that the integration axiom is underspecified. We need to put something else to say exactly how one thinks to be integrated, or, you know, we have to do some other stuff. Uh, and that's where I'm going to go next. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, let's say, you know, there's many ways in which something can be integrated, because there's many ways in which two or more things can deviate from independence. So let's try and break it down into pieces and see if we can study them separately. And to do that, let's go back to basics. Uh, so I just want to examine very briefly what we mean by interdependence and relations and how do we make sense of these in a sort of probability theory or information theory framework. Um, so if you have two neurons, then these two neurons can really, they can either be correlated or not, uh, and that's measured by mutual information. If they're connected, the mutual information is greater than zero, otherwise equal to zero, done. Problem is, when you have three neurons or more, um, there's qualitatively different modes of interaction that these neurons could be having. So we could have a mode of interaction in which the three neurons are doing something together, and then when I cut one out, I lose the connection between these two. Or I could have another mode in which if I cut one out, the connection between the other two remains. And those are qualitatively different. In both cases, they deviate from independence, but there's, again, some qualitative difference between these two modes. This one we call synergy, and this one we call redundancy. Um, long story short, and what my talk was supposed to be about is we have this way of calculating the, estimating the difference between redundancy and synergy based on some total correlation, some dual total correlation information theory business, which I'm not going to talk about, but I invite you if you're interested to go and have a look at that um, paper that should be ha appearing soon in uh, PRE, but it's on the archive. Really. Good. Let's now go and put some actual math on the synergy and redundancy business and see how it applies to um, integrated information. So we have a setting in which we have two predictive variables, think neurons, x1 and x2, that are sort of feeding into or trying to predict some variable y. Um, we have the joint predictability, that's the mutual information between the two x's and the y, and the marginal predictability of each one of the x's and the y. And sometimes what can happen is that the whole, meaning the joint predictability, is greater than either of the parts. And the way, we exp the way that this partial information decomposition, or this PID postulate, goes about this is, okay, I'm going to split this into four different parts. One is the redundancy, which is the information that either neuron has about Y. Then there's some unique information that only one of these neurons has about the target. And then there's some synergy, which is the information that both of them have when seen together, but they, neither of them have on their own. Okay? So this is a very beautiful theory, uh, and it can generalize to any number of like, sources, but so far you can only have one target neuron, or like one you know, thing you're trying to predict. Wouldn't it be great if we could extend this to multivariate time series, so we could apply this to a general dynamical system? Ta-da! We can. Uh, and there's this paper that we put out recently, conveniently on the day of Freddie Mercury's birthday, um, that outlines this unified theory of um, PID, partial information decomposition, IIT, that we called FIID, or integrated information decomposition. Um, and let's see how they go. So if we want to like, put them side by side, um, in partial information decomposition, we have this information between two things that decomposes in four, the redundancy, the unique, and the synergy. And this is actually a partial ordering structure. So the information that's in either of them is smaller than the information that's in one or the other, and those are, in, and those are smaller than the information that's in both. Similarly, we can do this trick, but for the multi-target setting, we can say that if, so again, think of x1, x2 as the past state of a system, and y1, y2 as the future state of the system, we can do the exact same trick. And now this partially ordered set becomes this other partially ordered set, and we can do a very, very similar trick that I'm not going to take you through. Um, I find this very interesting, and I was actually quite inspired by some of the earlier talks this week about trying to find out structure in qualia space of some sort. Um, some people even actually talking about set theory and sort of joins and meets and things. So 
maybe there's an interesting avenue for discussion here on to what extent can we map some set theoretic structure in information to some other set theoretic structure in qualia or phenomenological space or something. I have no idea how that would look, but it would be super interesting to, to have a thought about it. Cool. So now we can split this information that the whole system has about its own future. We can split it to a whole bunch of parts. And these parts show basically a bunch of modes of information dynamics. So we can have information that is redundant in the past and keeps being redundant in the future. That's two neurons basically having the same information and keeping it. Um, we can have unique information that is transferred. Or we can have information that is duplicated that was in one place before and then it is in two places in the future. Or we can have this other interesting bit where the two neurons have some information and that information is carried forward, but it's not in either of the parts. We're going to go think about that later when we talk about causal emergence. And now we get to the actual point about phi, which is that phi actually captures fundamentally different phenomena. So we can formulate these systems, one that has transfer dynamics, and then these two that have different types of synergistic dynamics. And phi is the same for all of them. So if you go and compute any of these versions of phi, you'll still get the same number. There's one bit of information being integrated. But if you look at which specific information effect is actually going on, you'll see that it's different ones that are lighting up, so to speak. Right? So in that sense, sure, you could compare and you could say that they're integrating the same amount of information. That would be fair enough. But it would sort of miss the point because they're qualitatively different. And there's, there's a different description we can give of them, which will give us a nicer picture. And we'll say, yeah, these two things are actually different in some meaningful way. Um, not only that, but we can get some of these uh, measures of integrated information. This was the original Tononi 2008 measure. We can break it down into pieces and we can see what's inside. And lo and behold, you do get this big mix of all of these different sort of information atoms, as we call them. We have some transfer atoms and some synergy atoms. We have a negative redundancy because it penalizes neurons having the same thing, the same information all the time. So we see that it is, in fact, this big mix of different effects. And we can go and do this thing for a whole bunch of measures. And we can see that, in fact, different measures, the same one I was showing earlier in this paper, they do actually just capture different types of effects. It's not only that they are different approximations to the same thing. They're different in principle. They're actually measuring different types of information effects. So what we've, what we've done with this exercise, if you want to think of this way, we basically tried to provide a nice basis in which to look at this set of information dynamics. We've basically had this bunch of measures that were sort of similar. But we didn't know in what way exactly. And now we've provided this more interpretable, fully disjoint sort of basis, so to speak, to reason about information dynamics in this type of systems. Good. In particular, and now going, OK, so this is where the actual like serious math basically ends. And now I'm going to go to things that are a bit more speculative for the last few minutes. Let's look at this other, this last thing, the synergistic storage business. And let's look at an example related to causal emergence. I'm going to have this example system in which with probability gamma, y1, y2, meaning the two time series in the future, or sorry, the, two, the states of the system in the future, have the same parity as x1, x2. So my only constraint is that the system maintains its parity with probability gamma. And the sample from the system, I get something out of something like this, where you can see that basically the parity is 0 up to this point, and then it changes to 1, and then it changes back to 0, and so on. The system has one very, very interesting property, actually, which is that the dynamics are not visible from any subset of the system. So if you try and compute any form of Granger causality, effective connectivity, as it is normally understood, all of this will, become, will come at zero. There's no neuron that receives input from the rest and then broadcasts it back to the others or anything. No, like the whole dynamics, the whole like information that is being maintained in the system or like transferred from past to future is all in the collective. So I like to think of this as a, some sort of statistical ghosts, right? There's some like statistical force that maintains information, but it's just floating above the actual units of the system. Like none of them actually sees the bit of information that it's carrying it. And yet the whole system collectively 
is keeping this bit of information that's a parity. And for the system, we have this synergistic storage atom that's equal to one, and all the others are equal to zero. And my claim, sort of speculatively, is that this is an example of emergent causation. It's a type of you know, causal structure or dynamical rule that is in the whole, but it is not reducible to, a, to any of the subsets of the system. And this is admittedly a very weird kind of system, but let's go and have a look at some other examples. Um, and one thing that comes out nicely of this 5D framework is that we can give you a very theoretical, a very precise theoretical definition, somewhat tentative. But I'll say that a system shows causal emergence if and only if we have information being transferred in chunks of the system that does not actually is not seen from any of the subsets. Um, so we can, in words, yeah, there's causal power that is irreducible to individual variables, either in the past or the future. And not only that, but I can also give you a practical criterion, which is, <clears throat> you know, of course, computing this thing is actually kind of tricky. We can define it mathematically very well, but computing it will take a while uh, with our current methodology. But we can formulate very nice bounds on this. And we can say, well, if you have a system and you have some sort of candidate emergent features, well, I think this is an emergent property of this system, then you can compute this bunch of mutual information. Basically, you can say, well, calculate whether the emergent feature has more causal power over itself than the sum of the individual variables. And if that's true, then that's true. And notice that we've lost an F, we've lost an F in this process, right? So this is very easy to compute, but now this is a sufficient criterion, but it's not necessary. As a couple of examples to end my talk, um, one example is in this game of life thing. So a game of life is this very funny um, cellular automaton that's often used in um, emergent studies. And what I do is I can, you can get these two particles. This is a glider, there's a spaceship. You clutch them together, they mess around, and then they, sta they stabilize into these stable structures. So we can have a micro variable that's the cell states, or a macro variable that's the particle type on you know, who is colliding and where and blah, blah. And with this definition, the game of life shows very, very clearly this emergent property. In which, so in the sense that if you see the system at the level of particles, it makes a whole lot of sense and you can predict the future with some very, very good causal power. In the meantime, each one individual cell doesn't know what it's doing. It's just silently partaking in this sort of grand scheme of things that is the emergent causality happening at a collective level. Similarly, for neural oscillations, talking about bin spikes and actual oscillation phase. Um, and finally, to wrap up real quick, restate my conclusions. I argue there's no such thing as a single universal measure of integrated information, because integrated information is an aggregate of different effects. And we should be looking at all of those effects and how they relate between each other and to the structure of phenomenology as a sort of tentative, um, speculative research agenda. We presented this framework via ID that allows us to compare five measures and to propose new ones and to manipulate them in nice ways. And FIDE might give us some insights into causal emergence, as well as some other concepts like upward and downward causation. Um, lots of stuff you have to do. This is a very new thing. And I'll bid. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>